Greetings, brothers and sisters, and welcome to the first Sunday of Lent. Uh, the first Sunday of Lent always looks at the temptation of our Lord. Um, and our theme for this time is, It is Written. And we'll look at this story of Jesus's temptation in Luke 4, uh, where again and again he quotes from the scriptures saying, It is written um, when he is tempted. So the season of Lent, we are reflecting on uh, the people of God and the universal priesthood as a city set on a hill, as uh, those who show Christ to the world. During Lent, we focus on Christ's hum humiliation, his suffering, his death, uh, as we walk with him toward the cross. Um, and we now, uh, like he was displayed on a hill, we are uh, a city on a hill as well. Um, and this theme, it is written, uh, in Luke 4, uh, the story of Jesus's temptation. Uh, this year uh, was an Olympic year, a uh, winter Olympic year. And if your family or households like mine, we watched a lot of Olympics and a lot of watching them, uh, especially the aerial type uh, events where they're twisting and turning and flipping and doing all of these things. And they have all these crazy names and start talking about how they rotate at 1800 degrees and all kinds of stuff. But if you watch them do that, they actually, um, when they're twisting and flipping, they turn their head and try to keep their eyes uh, on a certain thing. It's called spotting. And they do it because you can very easily lose your sense of what is up and down and what is uh, which direction you're going when this is happening in the air. So you have to have this anchor point, this spotting point uh, to keep you oriented. Uh, and we're going to look at this story of Jesus's temptation. And he really uses scripture as that kind of anchoring point. He, he's, he's spotting in a very uh, confusing and difficult a uh, twisty turny kind of environment, and he uses scripture as that anchor point to ground him. Uh, we're going to exegete Luke 4, and then we'll explore this theme in scripture and experience one of the theme's takeaways. So if we step back in Luke um, and look at the context just a little bit, this is kind of the end of the beginning of Jesus's life. So you have all the events of the beginning of Jesus's life, his birth, um, and it goes through his genealogy and his baptism and, and all of these sort of initial things that are not done in a very public way, or he's not preaching. He's not uh, doing anything in terms of gathering disciples and proclaiming the gospel or anything. We've got these stories are just sort of taking place. Um, and this is the end of that. The, the temptation sort of marks the end of the beginning. Um, and after this, after Jesus comes out of the wilderness, out of the temptation, he begins to preach openly that the kingdom of God is at hand. Um, and this happens in all the Gospels. Uh, so if we look at the story in Luke 4, this is what it says. It says, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. And so right before this, Jesus has been baptized. The Spirit has descended on him as a dove. And uh, it was in the Jordan River with John. So he is led then by the Spirit into the wilderness, into the, the Judean wilderness. And he's out there for 40 days being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. And so the Judean wilderness is not, um, not like a wooded wilderness or a jungly. It's, it's desert wilderness. It's dry. It's sort of barren. It's not, it's a rocky, hilly, uh, difficult place. Um, and Jesus is out there for 40 days and he's not eating. He doesn't say much about his, whether he's drinking or anything, but he's uh, fasting for 40 days out in the wilderness and being tempted by the devil. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. I mean, you can just imagine Jesus after 40 days said he was hungry. He says, if you're the son of God, if, if what God said is true, then command this stone. Why don't you go ahead? You look hungry. Why don't you go ahead and make this stone some bread? But Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And so you have the devil tempting him with this very physical sort of need for bread. Um, and Jesus, um, I, I don't know if, if I had been fasting for 40 days in the desert and the devil came to me and I legitimately could turn stones into bread, then I, I might be, I, I might be feeling that. And I'll be like, yeah, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Um, but Jesus, um, 
in the midst of probably, I mean, in a human way thinking some of these things, I would imagine like, yeah, bread sounds really good right now. Um, he, he anchors himself and he says, no, it is written that man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Um, and so he uh, rejects this first temptation, uh, but the devil comes back at him again. The devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. So somehow the devil takes him up on a hill, up on a mountain, and he, he sort of shows him all the kingdoms of the world. Um, and he makes a really interesting claim. He says, uh, the power over these has been given to me. Um, and it, it's a weird thing, but in the rest of the New Testament, we see these hints that the devil has some kind of power or some kind of authority in the world. In 1 John 5, he says, the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul calls the devil the god of this age. Um, and so there's some sense in which there is power there, which he does have authority. Um, there's a really interesting connection also between this text in Luke and then what's the, called the Great Commission at the end of Matthew. Uh, the devil took him up on a mountain. The Great Commission actually, the, Jesus and his disciples gather on a mountain. He shows them all the kingdoms of the world. Jesus actually tells his disciples to go make disciples of all nations or all the kingdoms of the world. He says that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Um, and this is what the devil claims. He says, I'll give you this authority for it's been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. Um, and the devil says, if you'll worship me, it will be yours. Um, and in verse 17 of Matthew 28, the, the, it's the disciples who worship Jesus. And then he gives them the authority to go into all nations and proclaim the presence of the kingdom. And so what we see in this temptation is, uh, I, don't, I don't know what the devil knew, I don't know uh, what was happening, but there is a connection between what he is offering and what Jesus came to do. Uh, what, what he is offering is in some sense a shortcut to what Jesus came to do. Um, and Jesus, at the end of his life, claims that through his death and resurrection, he has now claimed all of this authority and he has fulfilled uh, what he came to do. What the devil offered him here, he uh, fulfilled himself um, in the end. Uh, and he answers, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Um, he absolutely is not going to, to bow down and, and worship the devil. Um, he's not going to uh, give in to this uh, shortcut to, uh, to this end that, that he is after. And then the last temptation the devil gives him he took him to Jerusalem and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Uh, the, the top of the temple would have been uh, probably hundreds of feet in the air. I can imagine this just dizzying and disorienting. And I mean, I don't know how this happened. He's showing him all nations. And then all of a sudden, like flash whirl, he's on top of the temple. I don't, I really have no idea how this took place, but it sounds dizzying. It sounds kind of like, you know, um, but he, he tells him, throw yourself down, make this very public display uh, of God saving you because he promised in the scriptures and the devil actually quotes Psalm 91. This is, he's not wrong. The, the Bible says this. Uh, he won't let you strike your foot against the stone. He won't uh, let you uh, be hurt. Throw yourself down and prove that you are, in fact, uh, the one God was talking about. But Jesus answers him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. And so Jesus says, no, I'm not going to make God prove that he loves me. I'm not going to throw myself down in this needless display of uh, endangering my life just to make him catch me, to, to prove something. I'm not going to put him to the test. I, I believe that he is who he says he is. I believe what the scriptures say uh, of me and of him. And so each time Jesus, in this very uh, weak and disorienting um, and uh, tempting, honestly, s situations, he 
says it is written or it is said, and he quotes the scriptures as his anchor, as his uh, spotting point uh, to, to orient himself and to orient his mind and to resist the temptation of the devil. Uh, brothers and sisters, scripture is the sword of the spirit. Uh, this is, it, it is the, the, the weapon at hand uh, that can anchor us, that can really steady us and um, can in fact uh, prove to uh, fight off the temptations of the devil and, and all, all sorts of, of difficulties. Scripture is the sword of the spirit. Uh, it is uh, the equipment God has given us to stand. This is a quote from Ephesians 6. Um, it says, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. And then later on, after it talks about other equipment, it says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Um, and we see Jesus using it in the way exactly that Paul talks about here as um, extinguishing the um, enemy's temptations and fighting and protecting him from the enemy. Uh, the rest of the, the Bible talks about this as well. Um, it, it speaks, the New Testament in particular, speaks of the scriptures as something which is not only um, to be read and to be understood, but, it, but it, there, it is this piece of equipment that it is useful, that it is uh, somehow to be taken in hand. Uh, Romans 15, Paul says, For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of scriptures we might have hope. Um, so he's, he's picturing here that everything that was written down before is, is for us, that it was, it's for our equipment, it's for us to, uh, to use and to be encouraged and to have hope. Uh, it, again, in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, Now these things happened, speaking of the wilder, wilderness wanderings of the Israelites. He said, These things happened as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Again, he, he paints scripture as something which is um, put in our hands for our, for our instruction, for our benefit, uh, for our equipment. And then in a pretty direct uh, correlation to uh, Ephesians 6, the author of Hebrews says uh, that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Um, and so you get this sense of the, uh, the sharpness of Scripture, the, the usefulness of it, the, the incisive nature of it, um, and uh, clearly pictured as, as a kind of sword, a two-edged sword. Uh, and so the Scripture is the sword of the Spirit, brothers and sisters. Scripture is this uh, tool, this equipment that God has given us uh, that we might stand against evil, that we might stand in the face of temptation, that we might, in fact, have something to, uh, to use and to stand on uh, when, when everything is disorienting and everything is difficult. Uh, so if we're going to uh, have a takeaway, we'll take this away with you, brothers and sisters. Cling to the scripture. Cling to scripture. Um, if we want to experience one of the, the takeaways from Jesus's story here of the temptation, uh, we must do what he did. He, he did what he did as an example. He did what he did as a pattern for us. He was faced with, with weakness and confusion and um, temptation and um, all sorts of these uh, difficulties. And in the midst of that, he said, no, it, it is written, you will love the Lord your God. No, it is written, don't put him to the test. He clung to the scriptures. Um, I know that there are there are times when we just want to give up, just want to give in. We want to raise the white flag and say, sure, I'll turn that stone into bread because I'm really hungry. I'll, I'll do what has to be done. Sure, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give in. Um, and, and you just feel uh, frustrated and disoriented and, and confused and you don't know what to do and your, your kids aren't acting right and things aren't going your way at work. And I mean, just... It's dizzying. It's frustrating, um, and and you just want to give up, right? You just want to you just want to be like, forget it. Uh, I'll just you know do what I got to do. Uh, like Jesus, we can cling to Scripture. Scripture is our anchor. It can be our spotting point. 
uh, in, in the twisting and turning of life, uh, we can actually depend on the scripture to orient us, to keep us upright, to keep us uh, fighting. Brothers and sisters, the scripture is the sword of the spirit. Cling to the scriptures. Cling to the scriptures uh, like Jesus did. Thank you for watching. If you've been blessed by this video, please like, share, and subscribe.